the first sustainability leadership presentation series of the 2017-2018 year. Central Community College is glad you have joined us today for this presentation. We are also very fortunate to have such a great group of partners, including the Center for Urban Sustainability at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, Hastings College Student Environmental Action Coalition, Joslin Institute for Sustainable Communities, Metropolitan Community College, Nebraska Recycling Council, and the University of Nebraska Lincoln Environmental Studies Program. So just a couple housekeeping items. Um, all attendees are in listen-only mode to prevent any background noises, but you are invited to ask questions through the presentation, um, so you can do that a few ways. One way is to put questions directly into the WebEx chat box. Um, if you are in a live viewing room, uh, you can also give your questions to your room host, and then they will put them in the chat box. And lastly, you can ask questions through Twitter using the hashtag SLPS Thursday. So we're very excited to have Rachel Anderson presenting on Attracting Pollinators, Gardens for Bees and Butterflies. Rachel works in Lincoln, Nebraska as the Community Landscape Specialist of the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum. Rachel holds a Master of Landscape Architecture from Iowa State University and a Bachelor of Science in Horticulture from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. She is passionate about how ecological garden design can connect people to the outdoors while protecting our, wild, our wildlife, water, and soil. So thank you for presenting today, Rachel. I am going to go ahead and pass things over to you. Great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be part of this series. Um, and I am excited to talk to you all about attracting pollinators. So how can we grow our gardens to be great places for bees and butterflies and other uh, beneficial insects. So what I'm going to go over today um, are these key points. So why care about pollinators? Uh, who are they? What are the threats to pollinators? Um, how to help pollinators? And then specifically talking about plants and then ending on um, discussing a few resources. So we start with why care about pollinators? Well, pollinators are behind one in three bites of food we eat. So they're an essential part of the food web. Um, without bees, which are one of our pollinators, we wouldn't have fruits like apples, pumpkins, strawberries, blueberries. Uh, many of those great foods we find in the grocery store uh, depend on pollination and pollinators. Uh, along with um, thinking about food, we can also attribute uh, the health of our natural areas to pollinators since pollinators play such a critical role in plant reproduction. So without pollinators, our prairies would not look the same, our woodlands would not look the same. Um, so they're a healthy part of our ecosystems as well. So yeah, uh, here are some wild plums and they are one of the plants that are uh, pollinated by insects. So that's just one of the fruits we'd be missing if we didn't have them. Um, there are over 150 U.S. crops valued at $18 billion um, that need insect pollination. So it's part of our economy as well. And then looking at um, the health of our natural places. So pollinators and insect pollinated seeds and fruits feed countless wildlife. Um, and without pollinators, we wouldn't have food for uh, birds like cedar waxwings, or we wouldn't have goldenrod for our prairies. So uh, you may be wondering, well, what is pollination? Uh, and basically, um, plants use pollination to reproduce uh, through seeds and fruits. So some plants are wind pollinated. Um, it's the wind that takes the pollen from flower to flower, but actually about three, four, 75% um, require animals. And um, plants and pollinators need each other uh, to survive. And many native plants require native pollinators and vice versa. There's a lot of pollinators that um, are have evolved to be dependent on one certain plant. So if that plant was gone, the pollinator would be gone. Or if that pollinator was gone, then that plant would be gone. Um, and talking about who are our pollinators. 
So we have a few different kinds. Bees and wasps are very important pollinators. Also our moths and our butterflies and the caterpillars associated with each. Um, flies are pollinators and uh, even beetles are pollinators. Some non-insect pollinators are birds and bats. I won't be focusing on birds and bats today. I'll be focusing on our, our insect pollinators. So yeah, looking at bees, bumblebees, honeybees, sweat bees, mason bees. We hear a lot about honeybees, but there's a lot of um, native bees too, like bumblebees. And then um, wasps, I believe this is a paper wasp foraging. Uh, going to butterflies, here's a moth, an example of a fly. This one's actually not a house fly. Some flies look like bees, they're um, lookalikes. So there's a lot of different flies that are pollinators. And then here's some beetles uh, on a milkweed flower. So if we look at uh, what are the threats to pollinators, why is everyone talking about pollinators these days? Well, many uh, wild pollinator populations are trending downward, and nearly one-third of native bumblebee species is declining. And actually, the rusty patch bumblebee is now listed as an endangered species that happened um, this year. So there are some definite uh, threats two are pollinators. Uh, one of the major ones is habitat loss. So if you uh, look around, most places are tough for pollinators. There's not much food or shelter. Um, there's few different kinds of plants and there's not many native species. Uh, if you look at this picture, you know, do you see any flowers? Um, which are pollinator food. I don't really see any, and a lot of this area is mown, so we don't have those bare spots or um, dead wood for nesting and overwintering. And then um, this is happening in the country and in town. You know, lawns are mo monocultures, and a lot of times fields are too. So we want to shake these landscapes up, bring some diversity in, um, have our homes be our pollinator habitat. Uh, another uh, threat to pollinators is pesticides. So um, these are bug killers and weed killers. Bug killers can kill pollinators directly. Um, small bees can die even from low concentrations. And there's a special kind called neonicotinoids um, that's newer, and that is especially a deadly chemical for for pollinators. Um, weed killers uh, don't kill pollinators directly, but they do reduce habitat. So they, um, when you're killing plants, you leave less flowers um, with pollen and nectar, which are, again, that pollinator food. Many weeds are pretty critical um, as food to pollinators, including clover, dandelion, violet, uh, and henbit. So how to help, there are pretty much three ways um, that I'm gonna focus on today. One is protect good habitat when you see it. So if you're out and about, um, try to identify areas that look like good habitat and then try to um, conserve those areas. Also, you can provide new areas, new places for habitat um, in, our, in our gardens especially. Uh, and you can use pollinator-friendly maintenance practices, which I will go over in a little more detail here. So trying to identify good habitat, what does, what does that look like? What does good habitat have? Um, number one, it has pollinator-preferred flowers um, that are blooming from early in the season to late in the season. So having that um, consistent bloom uh, means having consistent food available. So we definitely want that. And then having safe, undisturbed places uh, to nest and spend the winter. So one form of disturbance is mowing. Um, so having maybe some wild corners or some unmown areas if you can. Also uh, having that protection from poisonous chemicals. Uh, we talked about those pesticides. Uh, one book that's really good for 
identifying good habitat is called um, attracting native pollinators, and it's from the Xerce Society. So if you really want to get in depth with this, I, I would recommend this book. Uh, some examples. So here, this is in a lawn. These are ground nesting bees in a lawn. So um, instead of uh, trying to remove these nests, if it's possible, uh, maybe leave them undisturbed, uh, allow these bees um, to live out their life cycles. Uh, and here we see um, a wonderful garden in the winter, and you notice that most of the leaf debris and sticks have been left uh, left up. They haven't been cut back. And those um, are the places where a lot of our pollinators um, hibernate or overwinter uh, during the colder months. So a lot of little bugs are, are probably hiding in those, uh, that foliage there. Uh, looking at wood, so you can't always uh, leave uh, dead branches or dead wood, but whenever there's an opportunity to leave uh, these items, you might want to consider it because these are also um, nesting areas and uh, overwintering areas for a lot of insects, including um, our beetles. And here we've got um, a hive inside. Uh, and then talking about that protection from pesticides. So if you can, try to uh, avoid spraying uh, pesticides or, or even um, tree injections. You know, uh, emerald ash borer is something that a lot of people are injecting their trees for. And uh, just be aware that, that um, your target insect might not be the only insect being affected by uh, these chemicals. So uh, I'm a gardener. I'm a garden designer. So I'd like to talk about how do you create pollinator-friendly gardens? Uh, it's really fun to do. So uh, there are some specific things that go beyond conventional gardening where you can help pollinators while having a beautiful uh, outdoor place. One thing to think about is having uh, bigger patches of habitat close together versus small isolated uh, patches. So if you can do um, a larger garden that's down the street from your neighbor's pollinator garden, uh, that'd be a really great, great thing. Uh, you also want an area with good sun exposure. A lot of these pollinator preferred plants um, like a lot of sun. So if you're in a really shady situation, uh, your options for plants are going to be um, somewhat limited. Um, you also want to have nesting resources nearby. And nesting resources are like that dead wood and sticks and stems. Also, um, patches of bare soil for those ground nesting uh, insects. And then native grasses and um, sedges are great uh, shelter as well. So um, rather than planting one of everything, uh, you'll want to consider um, planting flowers in groups. This actually um, makes them easier to find for these uh, flying bees and butterflies and, and other pollinators. So try to have, you know, threes, fives, sevens, um, instead of one or two of something. And then again, having many kinds of flowers um, that bloom all, all season. Not that one flower has to bloom all season, but that you have something blooming at any given time. And when you have different flower shapes, flower colors, sizes, each one of those is going to um, attract a different kind of pollinator. So having a mix uh, is not only uh, visually pleasing, but it's good uh, for pollinators too. And then um, native plants are four times more likely uh, to attract native bees. So basically, this is a uh, uh, finding from the Xerce Society. And most of this research is based out of California, but we are doing uh, local research in Nebraska to see um, which plants your non-native or your native plants 
does it make a difference and which ones are pollinators going for? So uh, the jury's still out on that one for Nebraska, but uh, research elsewhere has shown that native plants are more likely to attract um, native pollinators. So you really want to try to include those in your garden where you can. And then also having that um, more wild back corner, uh, maybe it's out of sight so that it doesn't have to be as manicured or polished um, and can kind of be left alone. So uh, that'd be a great habitat area. Uh, here's one example. So uh, this is in a backyard and you have a mixture of native and non-natives and turf and flowers. Uh, but it all works, and uh, this can serve as, as great habitat at home. But it's not just at home. Uh, you can also have it other places. So I'm going to show you a few other examples here. Um, this example is, is at an office. You can have habitat at, at your office landscaping. This is the Nebraska Game and Park headquarters. Um, and they've got a great mix of native plants and non-native plants, annuals, perennials. Um, tropicals, and I think they're also trying out some some cultivated varieties too. Uh, here, I think the main lesson is that clean edge. So in the last picture, we saw that wonderful sweeping edge uh, where the lawn meets the border, the perennial border, and here we have this great wall. So uh, the having that clean edge uh, is kind of a sign of care and can make something look more intentional uh, and can really be a great um, border uh, adding definition to a garden. Uh, and then they have signage. Signage always helps um, educating visitors or neighbors about oh, what's the purpose of this garden? You know, it's not just for uh, looks, but there's actually um, some other benefits as well. And then uh, here is on the other side of the building. So this is more of a fuzzy border, right? It's, and it's, it makes sense that it's more fuzzy because it's away from the entrance. So really, um, this is going to be seen from the street from a car. And in a car, you know, going 20 miles an hour, you don't really pick up uh, all the fuzziness or if there's a weed or two. So thinking about uh, where you can get away with these um, more fuzzy areas. And then having a mix of trees and shrubs here too is great. Um, another example is Union Plaza. So this is in Lincoln. Um, and this is a park. So you it can happen at offices and at home and also uh, at parks. And here this park is really great at um, at inviting people with, you know, this splash pad, and they've also got a concert venue. So it's all about people, too. Uh, and here we have lots of native plants. We have lawn where it makes sense. You can see in the background they have that amphitheater. So having lawn there is is great, uh, and, it, and it's traffic tolerant, so when you have large crowds. But in other areas, um, they have more plants so you can if you have options it's good and then uh there this is a wonderful example of creating a sense of place too so they're using native materials limestone uh for their seating and it really grounds it and says wow this is nebraska along with um the prairie plant palette uh, and then the other cool thing about Union Plaza is there's kind of different areas for different management levels. So right up towards the street at the entrance, they have these planters. You know, those take a, a little more input, a little more time, a little more money, and they look really polished, really great at the entrance. Uh, and then uh, you can see on the right, they have areas like in the foreground where it's a little more manicured, there's more time spent there. But in the background across the way, that's more of a meadow type situation, the, the pollinator garden. Um, so it's, it's less manicured and 
that's okay because, again, you're having bikes going across that trail, and they're not going to notice every little weed. So uh, this project leaves room for, for prioritizing where your management goes and where your inputs go. And looking too uh, at the at school, so you can definitely have pollinator gardens at school. It's an excellent learning opportunity. This is the backyard farmer garden um, at UNL, and it's a often example of a learning garden. It looks wonderful in all seasons. Uh, there's a mix of annuals and perennials. And what I love about this garden, well, one of the things is that it really connects to food production. So we talked about how important pollinators are to our vegetables and herb gardens and orchards. And this um, this garden has all those right there. You can kind of see the the squash and, and there's tomatoes and stuff. So people can really make that uh, connection. And it even uh, has stormwater management gardens too. So they're talking about food, they're talking about water, habitat, uh, and people. Again, people are kind of at the center of all these, these gardens. Um, another view, so this is, you know, it's, it looks great. You've got wonderful colors, and um, it's just an example of, of what can happen when you've got expertise, when you've got knowledgeable managers. So um, we've got professors uh, and staff working on this garden, improving it all the time. So that's partly why, you know, it looks so great and polished is because we've got knowledgeable horticulturists uh, actively managing it. And then um, just looking uh, at the panhandle uh, west, this is uh, downtown Scotts Bluff. And so they're doing pollinator stuff too um, in their streetscape gardens. And uh, so these gardens are real workhorses. They're managing stormwater, which is rain running off of paved surfaces rather than it going to the sewer, it's going into these gardens and being cleaned and absorbed. So it's a great uh, water uh, benefit garden. And then also it's shading the pavement. You see the tree there. So we've got reducing the urban heat island effect. And then again, you've got that habitat with those native plants and the signage really educating people. So they're a wonderful partner um, out west, Scott's Bluff is. And they're doing it, man. Uh, so here we've got a fireworks restaurant. So uh, this is more of a trail situation. And uh, it's more of a wild garden, right? It's almost a prairie. So you can have many different kinds of looks and still uh, benefit pollinators. It doesn't fit just just one aesthetic. So here we've got a trail, um, and it's this area is pulling in all the water uh, from the entire parking lot of this restaurant that's that's out of view. So again, performing a lot of different functions here, but still great pollinator habitat. And then even um, we talked about. Uh, streets in town, but streets out of town, too, are, are highways. This is Highway 2, uh, and it's got a wonderful mix of wildflowers. And I don't know if these were seeds were sown or if they um, grew naturally, but, yeah, what if we can have our roads be a pollinator habitat as well, where we might mow them uh, less per year, we might sow them with these pollinator preferred species, uh, all great possibilities. And if you think about when I talked about earlier how you want, you don't want isolated patches, you want these connections. Well, our roads are, are connecting um, places. So if you have pollinator habitat lining these roads, then it's almost like a pollinator highway uh, going through the state. So we talked about creating pollinator-friendly gardens, but then what do you do once they're in the ground? How do you manage them? Uh, so here are some pointers. Um, one is you really want to avoid using insecticides, using bug killers. Uh, 
uh, and you want to use weed killers sparingly after planting. I, um, in a lot of gardens, I do use weed killers initially to get the weeds out and make sure that they don't come back. But some people don't do that. You know, there are organic ways to uh, to get rid of weeds before you plant. But afterwards, you probably you really want to wean off of it. Um, also, letting plants stand over the winter as habitat. So uh, we talked about that too. And it's really great visual interest with all of our wonderful prairie grasses and our amazing flowers and the seed heads they create. Um, so letting plants stand over the winter uh, is a really important and, and easy way to uh, support pollinators. Also having that room for, for a wild corner, uh, if you can manage it. And then leaving bare ground uh, for those nesting bees. And I just want to um, make a point that most native bees are not aggressive. Um, aggressive bees, like honeybees, are, are, have colonies. They're social bees. And bumblebees are too. So when they're protecting their hive, that's when they're going to be aggressive. But um, na most native bees are solitary bees, so they don't have that hive. Um, so they're not going to um, go after you and sting you. And even so, when a bee is foraging, you, you know, getting pollen and nectar from different flowers, it's really not even paying attention to you. It's when you get close to the nest um, that some, you know, that aggression uh, can happen. So just a note there. And then I love having a sign. I think it can help inform people what you're doing and um, help answer questions and also start conversations uh, so that we can spread the word about pollinators and, and their plight. So this is a um, pollinator garden calendar that's available on the Arboretum website. And it's more of a visual guide on, oh gosh, well, what do I do um, each season, what should I kind of make sure that I'm paying attention to? So if we look at spring, um, we've got some pointers like uh, pushing mulch away, mulch away from plant, plant crowns uh, and keeping it less than two inches deep. This is because a lot of our native plants um, sometimes get choked out from wood mulch. So Rather than having a mulch garden, we want, we want a lush garden with lots of plants, so making sure that we're not burying them uh, in our wood mulch. And then uh, spring is the time you want to cut back last year's stems if you want that tidy look. So you left it all up through the winter, and, and spring is the time where you can cut that back. But you really uh, want to try to leave about a foot of stems um, for those hibernating pollinators. If we look at summer, just some, some pointers for what can you do in summer. You want to re reserve some bare dirt in a sunny spot for ground nesting bees, um, keeping the yard safe from pesticides, having that wild corner. And then when fall comes around, um, yeah, try to hold off on that cleanup if you can. Uh, leave those plants standing. And then even um, mulching, Rather than going out and, and buying wood chips, you can actually mulch with the leaves falling from your trees or the lawn clippings from your lawn. Uh, and you can do that until the garden matures and kind of becomes its own living mulch. And autumn uh, is also a great time to try and get rid of some of those persistent weeds. Um, a lot of weeds are still green when native plants go dormant. So if you have a garden of native plants and um, they've all, you know, gone brown and, and dormant, then the stuff that's still green, uh, you can hit that uh, with, with an herbicide or, or pull the weeds um, to, to get rid of them. Um, in the winter, again, you want to leave uh, stems and leaves standing, and also have some fun with your garden uh, in the winter, too. Make a bee hotel 
uh, or a scrapbook of pollinator photos from the yard. Uh, pollinator gardens are a great way uh, to get kids uh, in nature and thinking about nature. So looking specifically at plants, um, what what plants are good for pollinators? We've talked about these pollinator preferred plants. Well, you want a mix of spring, summer, and fall bloomers. Um, you also want host plants, and I'll talk about that in a minute. So host plants for caterpillars of butterflies and moths. Uh, and then also talking about some pollinator friendly weeds. So this is another publication um, on our website, plantnebraska.org, and it um, is basically plant lists. Uh, what are the best plants for pollinators in spring, early summer, late summer, and autumn? And we have our top garden picks um, if you're just starting out, and uh, a long list can be overwhelming. So we have six plants in each season that really stand out. Uh, and as you can see, they're, they're a mixture of flower colors and um, flower types. So one great one in the spring is, is wild columbine, and that's where you see this bumblebee uh, up in a wild columbine flower. Looking into early summer, um, some top picks uh, on the left, that's purple prairie clover, uh, a really cool um, native plant that also adds nitrogen uh, to your soil, so it helps with soil building. And then on the, oh, that's on the left. And then on the right, we have um, our bee balm. It's also called bergamot, uh, and that's such a interesting looking flower. And it's called bee balm, so you know uh, that the bees really love that one. If we look at late summer, um, one uh, pollinator just magnet is uh, mountain mint um, and that's on the left that white flower there so yes uh, if you can throw some mountain mint in your garden you'll get all kinds of pollinators and then on the right we see a monarch um, at a joe pie flower uh, that's a beautiful uh, pink flower that you can get tall ones or shorter shorter plants but that's a good one to have too. And if we go into autumn, um, this is a picture of Wichita Mountain's goldenrod. So it's a cultivated variety of goldenrod, uh, and you can just see it's loaded with pollinators and all kinds. I'm seeing butterflies, I'm seeing flies, beetles, bees. So this one is just buzzing uh, with pollinators. Very cool plant for autumn. Uh, but we don't want to forget about our uh, trees and shrubs either. Uh, having early, early blooming uh, trees and shrubs in the early spring is really important because not much else is blooming at that time. So having red bud and service berry and your wild plum and choke cherry, your crab apples, all those are important uh, early, early food sources. Uh, bumblebee queens uh, especially are very early to emerge in the spring and depend on these types of sources. Looking at summer, there's some excellent shrubs. Uh, this is a picture of button bush, and you'll find it loaded with, with insects when it has its pom-pom blooms. Very, very cool shrub. And there's not much blooming in the fall, but here we've got um, witch hazel, very interesting spider-like uh, blooms, and that's a great uh, fall bloomer. There's a spring bloomer, too. And I mentioned um, host plants earlier. So host plants are plants where uh, they are feeding are caterpillars, not through their flowers, but actually the caterpillars are feasting on the leaves. So if you think about um, caterpillars of moths and butterflies, they have different dietary requirements, different things that they eat than um, full-grown butterflies and moths. So we need to make sure that we're feeding our adolescent uh, pollinators as well as our adults and that's where these host plants are very important. So some really great examples are any oak tree. They host over 400 species of caterpillars. I mean that's 
that's a really <laughs> big number. And then looking at willows and cherries, cottonwoods, uh, and our native crab apple, these are all very uh, great food sources. And if you want to learn more about host plants and about um, Lepidoptera, our, our butterflies and moths, this is a great book, Bringing Nature Home um, by Douglas Tallamy. So if you really want to dig in on that, I suggest this reference. Talking a little bit about weeds. So uh, weed is kind of a plant out of place, right? And a lot of plants that we consider weeds uh, are pretty beneficial uh, to pollinators, including violets, uh, white clover, dandelion, creeping Charlie trefoil. Now, uh, it's, it's debatable on, wow, do we get rid of these or do we leave them? Um, but just know that some of these, you know, like violets stay pretty short and um, there are native violets. That's what's pictured here is, is violets that sprang up in my garden as volunteers. And, and I left them not just because I know um, the fritillary butterfly uh, depends on these, but also because they're great ground cover. You know, they're my living mulch. So uh, yay for violets. <laughs> Uh, looking at resources, so uh, the Nebraska State Way Arboretum has partnered with several communities on public projects, um, and we also have a program called Bloombox uh, that is all about bringing pollinator conservation home. So our Greener Towns program uh, funds larger landscape projects. So this is public benefit projects on campuses or streetscapes neighborhood gardens, schools, libraries, fairgrounds, trails. So if you have um, a project like this that, that you'd like assistance with and funding for, um, check out our Greener Towns program. Uh, and we hope we, all our funding is tied up for this year, but we hope to continue it in 2018. And this picture is actually a plan of a garden we did at Central Community College uh, in Columbus. Uh, it was a collaborative effort, so students were involved, it's, it's part of the curriculum, um, it also uses local resources and materials for the, for the paths and um, seating, and it's a place for people. And then our Bloombox program, so this is smaller scale, this is a hand-delivered mix of pollinator-friendly plants, uh, and they're actually customized. Uh, so you get a custom mix based on your yard and your style. And this is for, more for people who may want to help but don't really know how or want some pointers with gardening. Uh, and it's a cost share program um, for projects at home or school. And both this and Greener Towns uh, have been funded by the Nebraska Environmental Trust. So, so much thanks and kudos to the trust. Uh, for supporting these programs. And if you look, this is a map of the bloom boxes that have been sent out uh, since the program's inception. So uh, three cycles of bloom boxes since 2016. And it's great. We've got people all over the state and, and there's a really awesome Facebook community uh, that keeps the conversation going. And uh, we love the relationships we've built with with these folks, so we're really excited to see where this program goes in the future. Uh, yeah, and just to wrap up, you know, we talked about why I care about pollinators. Well, our food, our ecosystems depend on them. Um, who are they? There are bees, our wasps, our moths and butterflies, our flies and our beetles, um, and then the threats of habitat loss and pesticides. Uh, and how to help uh, minimize those threats and, and support our pollinators. So protecting habitat, creating new habitat, and also those pollinator-friendly maintenance practices. We talked about plants that bloom in the spring and the summer and the fall and our woody plants and our host plants. And then those programs like Greener Towns uh, and Bloombox can, that can serve as great resources for people wanting to help pollinators. And now I'd love to uh, open it up for questions. 
uh, and comments. Uh, that's really the end of my images. Okay, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so we have had a few questions come in. Um, so just a reminder that you can type your questions into the chat box, give them to your room host, or ask via Twitter using the hashtag SLPS Thursday. Um, so we'll start with the ones that we've had sent in. Let me scroll up here. Okay, one is, um, I've heard feedback that a big blue stem is in the pollinator garden. They seed out and take over other areas of the garden. Have you had any issue managing any particular plants, such as big blue stem, in new pollinator gardens that dominate? Oh, what an excellent question. Yes, yes. So, um, yeah, big blue stem can be a spreader. Uh, little blue stem, too. Some of our prairie plants uh, are really good at proliferating. So, uh, some ways to kind of control that um, that I've tried to implement are... Um, one is uh, putting less in the design. So instead of having maybe uh, 15 or 20 blue stem, just have a few. Uh, and you can also, if you're worried about them spreading, you can cut the, uh, when they're flowering, you can cut those flower heads off so that they don't produce more seed. I don't know if you're talking about spreading um, vegetatively or through reproduction. But yeah, you can cut the seed heads off. Uh, the other thing you can do is a lot of times cultivated varieties or cultivars are uh, less aggressive than the straight species. So using some of those cultivars. Uh, for for big blue stem, I really uh, can't think of a cultivar I know that is that is less of a spreader. But if you've already got it and it's already kind of a problem, I would recommend yeah, mowing or cutting it when it is when the seed is ripening in the fall. So maybe even, you know, this month so that it doesn't spread any further. Okay, thank you. Um also is there a natural weed killer that you recommend? Oh, that's a great question too. So uh, one thing I've tried is pouring boiling water over like my dandelions and um, weeds like that, and that can help. Um, I've also, let's see. That's really the organic method that, that I've tried. Maybe there's um, some folks that are online that uh, we could look at some resources where they use only organic methods. But yeah, a lot of times I do um, use, use herbicides, especially when starting out. Okay. That's a tough one. You know, I mean, if it was easy, man, we'd have it, we had it on lock. But yeah, that's a great, great question. And I would have to ask around about that, see what other people do too. Okay. Um, and then another one is, um, are all neonicotinoids, are they labeled as neonicot as having neonicotinoids in them? No, they're not. And what I've done before is call up the nursery and ask, you know, were neonicotinoids used uh, to grow this plant? Uh, and sometimes, you know, they'll use them for some plants and not others. So really getting to know your nursery uh, and calling them and asking is probably the most sure way to know. Okay, great. Um, and then will these slides be available anywhere after the presentation? Um, well, I guess, do you guys put them up? <laughs> um, we record the presentation and... So then, like, the recording, we put that on our website um, afterwards. Okay. Well, I'm not sure. I don't know if we could send out an email with the slides or if having the recorded presentation would be enough. Mm -hmm. But, um, no, I don't have them up on our, on our website. Okay. Yeah, so they'll be... Um, They'll be on our website, and it links to YouTube, so you can always pause on the particular slide you want to look at. Okay. And then going back to that um, 
you know, non-chemical methods. If you're talking about getting a garden started and you don't want to use, you know, glyphosate or whatever, you can try solarization. Um, it takes some forethought. It takes some planning, uh, but it works really, really well. So basically, uh, you get cardboard or plastic, um, and you cover the area in the heat of the summer so that it gets cooked, basically. I mean, so that the sun gets the the earth really, really hot, and it gets it so hot that it kills a lot of the weed seeds. So if you have, um, you know, if you can take a summer, uh, try solarization to prep your bed. Okay. Definitely have to plan ahead for that one. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so this one asks, is mountain mint edible? You know, uh, I have made mountain mint mojitos with it that were excellent. So uh, you can use it in cooking. And it actually has more menthol than a lot of other mints. Or no, that's bee balm. Bee balm has a lot more menthol. But I've I've used it before. It's not as um, you need to use more mountain mint than what the recipe would call for if it calls for mint. So does bee balm have more mintiness in it then? If it has more menthol? Yeah, yeah. If you okay. crush it, you can really smell it. Now bee balm, I have not used in cooking. Uh, I would have to ask around about that, but mountain mint, I have. Okay. Um, and then another one, does witch hazel grow well in Nebraska, and where can you find it? Oh, yeah. So um, witch hazel, again, there's a few different species. There's vernalis, which, which blooms in the spring, um, and then common witch hazel, which is uh, in the fall, and it does grow in Nebraska, but you need a protected location. If you think about where it naturally grows, it's in the woods. It's an understory tree or bush, um, so it does not take a lot of wind. If it's an open, uh, windy area, I would not go for witch hazel. Witch hazel also benefits from a little more acidic soil. So if you've got some of our, you know, higher pH, above 7, then maybe witch hazel wouldn't be the best plant. But no, um, in town, you know, under uh, overstory trees in your backyard or something, that that's a great place for witch hazel. Awesome. Um, another one is, they noticed that in Antelope Valley Project in Lincoln, they appear to be mowing some areas of meadow pollinator gardens sometimes. Um, can you talk more about flower types that would be able to be mowed once a month or so, but still bloom? Oh, cool question. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure how often they mow that, but uh, with a lot of prairies and meadows, you know, you mow maybe once a year in the spring or um, you might burn it, but that gets complicated if it's in town. Uh, but, yeah, if you're mowing it once a month, um, some of your lower plants like purple poppy mallow um, can do pretty well if it's mowed. Um, obviously, your grasses do okay. What are some other short ones? Maybe even like um, Missouri primrose or your violets. Um, let's see, what are some other ones? Maybe you could try geranium, like our hardy geraniums. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, we've got a lot of good questions, so we'll just keep them rolling. Um, what kind of plants would you recommend to start a small pollinator garden? Ooh, so if you're starting a small pollinator garden, really um, what I would recommend is kind of a layered approach where you've got a few what I would call anchor plants. Um, that are taller and are kind of the skeleton of your garden. So maybe one or two gay feather, um, that's a good, a good one, or New Jersey tea. 
uh, and then you you want um, a few more plants that are maybe you know shorter uh, around knee high uh, that'll be your seasonal stars uh, so those might be uh, purple cauliflower little blue stem um, obedient plants stuff like that that maybe is a little it's okay if it recedes a little bit or spreads or moves around uh, you get kind of that drift look and you also want uh, to incorporate a, a living mulch layer so about half your plants you want those to be those shorter plants that are going to cover the ground and keep your weeds out so that your your plants are your weed control uh, and some good examples of that are you know Pennsylvania sedge from your sedges or I mentioned violet or um, we have got a native coral bell uh, Heuchera richardsonii, which is really good for that. So uh, when I design a garden, I really do try to do those vertical layers. So I've got all my uh, visual interest with my anchors and my seasonal stars, but I've got my my weed control uh, with my my ground cover layer. And you kind of mix them all up so that uh, the ground cover fills in all the spots in between and underneath. Uh, your taller plants. Thank you. And we also uh, have resources on our website that talk more about that approach as well. Okay. And that would be the Nebraska Statewide Arboretum website? Yeah, plantnebraska.org. Okay. okay. Awesome. Um, another one is how can one get involved in the Bloom Box program? Oh, great question. So we um, do two cycles. We do a spring cycle and a fall cycle. Our fall cycle just ended, uh, but yeah, I check back in the spring. Um, it's an online application uh, to sign up. So again, <laughs> check on our website uh, in the spring and we'll be rolling out that program again. Okay, great. Um, and then we had a comment on controlling weeds naturally. One person said they've heard of using vinegar, and another one said they used um, landscape paper. I don't know if you've had experience with either of those. Okay. I haven't. Uh, I'm not sure what landscape paper is. That sounds cool. Uh, I've used landscape fabric before, and I have not had good luck with that. Um, it just... I tend to, you know, plants like to move and plants might die and you need to replant or transplant something. So fabric for me, uh, after a few years, there's just way too many holes because I need to cut through and plant something. Uh, so landscape fabric is good if you want your, your garden to kind of stay static, but static is hard for plants to do it's hard to maintain so i'd rather um, just try to do that living mulch method than than the fabric method to keep my weeds out and as far as vinegar yeah i have heard about vinegar too thank you for mentioning that okay and then we have a comment about um, blue stem and how to deal with that this person says, um, for aggressive native species, you can also plant like with like, so an aggressive species with aggressive, so they can bump heads and keep each other more in check. Um, matching root oh, zone cool. helps too. For example, planting another species with fibrous roots next to blue stem, so they have to fight for the same resources since their roots act similarly. What an excellent okay. point, yeah. Um, having competitors, competitive species have to battle it out in, in a garden is a really good uh, strategy for keeping them in check for sure. Okay, and then this question is, um, which campus did Greener Town's Fund Day project for for CCC? Well, we've got two. We, uh, a project in on the Columbus campus and then also on the Grand Island campus. They're both amazing gardens and um, thanks uh, to Benjamin Newton for for uh, hooking us up with those. Yes, we're very excited. Yeah, Hastings has one too. We were not involved with that pollinator garden, but Hastings has one too. 
It's a small one, but it's there. <laughs> um, okay, this one is, do you suggest having larger shrubs on the outside of your new pollinator garden? Is that a common design to protect new plants? Um, I, I wonder, are you talking about in terms of like wind protection? I would say yes, if it's a, if it's a farmstead, uh, then having that shrub border would be good to protect some of your um, more tender plants. But otherwise, uh, I'd say it'd be cool as far as having that clean edge. You know, I talked about a clean edge as far as a mowed line or a wall. Well, um, a shrub border can also work as a good clean edge. Okay, great. Um, and I have an update on the landscape fabric. It, um, this person used it to solarize their garden space. Oh, so that's what it was for. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, thanks for bringing that up. Great. I'll have to try that. <laughs> um, another question is, um, how do you know if you are protecting native pollinators versus any invasive ones? Oh, well, I would say if you stick to more of a native plant palette, then you're probably supporting more native pollinators. And if you do more exotic plants, then that might be supporting your exotic pollinators. But to be honest, I can't speak too much to that. Okay. So I'll do a last call for any questions. This is another question or a comment. Solar, solarization can kill soil, night, soil life, like microbes and those kind of things, um, so that they would be hesitant to use it. Have you had experience with that? Um, no, I haven't. A lot of the a lot of the gardens I work with are uh, the soil's not in great shape anyway. So um, if it if it is really good soil that has a lot of living components to it, then yeah, it sounds like that um, that's a great point to you want to keep that in mind. Lots of things to consider. <laughs> Okay, so it looks like that is all the questions that we have for today. So thanks so much um, for presenting. Um, and then our next presentation is from the University of Nebraska Lincoln Environmental Studies Program. Um, so that will be November 2nd. Um, so be on the lookout for more information on that when we get the promotion material rolling out. Um, so thank you, Rachel, for presenting. Um, and thank you to everybody for attending today. Uh, so, so like much. I said, we did record this presentation, so it should be up um, in about a week or two. All right. Thank you. Thanks. My pleasure.